And hey there, it's Albert Kaufman. I'm a community member here in Portland, Oregon. And I'm here today with Avi Klepper, who is going to um, talk with me a little bit about ideas we have for living together with other people well. In this current time, there's probably a very strong need for people to have resources, tools, ideas, um, and we hope to share some of those with you. And we'll also be working from a document that I put up yesterday at albertideation.com forward slash living together guidelines. And if you just go to albertideation.com and look for a recent post, you'll be able to see that document. Feel free to share it widely. Feel free to send back any feedback you might have about how to improve it. And Avi, would you like to introduce yourself? Well, thanks, Albert. Um, my name is Avi, and I'm a community member in Portland, Oregon, along with Albert. And I've been thinking about community for a lot of years since my divorce. Um, and I would say that my priority, or one of my big priorities in this phase of my life has been how do, how do I create community as an adult guy? And Fortunately, I've been in a community that has allowed me to experience that and has given me a kind of lab for experimenting with that. And I'm really surprised that a lot of people don't think about the nuts and bolts of this, but then I shouldn't be surprised because this is something none of us was ever taught. I don't know, Albert, were you ever taught about the nuts and bolts of how to live with somebody by your parents or anybody mm. else? I feel like I got some good information just from our lives together. Um, some things we did really well, some things we didn't do so well, but some things that we did do well felt like things that I wasn't seeing people uh, around me who were growing up in my world um, experiencing. So for instance, something that went well was we prioritized, um, a touch was a high priority. So we would kind of be, we would often lay around on each other or we would, my dad was very touchy. He'd like to hug, he'd like to wrestle a little bit. Uh, he played games with us when we were younger. There was a really wow. fun game I remember called This Side, That Side, where you'd come <laughs> up against him and you'd try to get past him. And then we were very little. And then he would just sort of like create just enough resistance. Well, it turns out that's a fantastic game. And I've learned later in life through my co-counseling world that that's a typical thing to work with um, people on physical power issues mm. is just to give them enough resistance so that they can push up against it and struggle a little bit, but still um, have feelings come up and things like that. So it was actually very smart. And I'm not sure where it came from because he didn't have a very um, touchy uh, upbringing as far as I know, but somehow that became part of our lives. So that was nice. We also prioritized um, not answering the phone. Um, over kind of hangout time with each other. So I remember very clearly a number of times we'd be sitting around in the living room and the phone would ring and we would all look at each other like, are you expecting a call? No, are you expecting a call? And then just let the phone ring. And we would just continue reading or hanging out with each other. And it was, you know, so we, we got certain things well. Yeah. So, yeah, so it was leading by example in your family. Mm-hmm. Well, I got to say that the example that was set for me in my family really did not address this at all. Mm. My dad was a community services lawyer. He was away a lot. I mean, as a baby boomer, I experienced life sort of like in this sort of old mainstream idea that's heavily gendered of the woman stays at home and the man goes off to work. And so as a result, dad was not around very much. I mean, when he was around, he was okay. But I don't recall seeing any examples between my mom and dad about how they negotiated things in the house. Mm -hmm. It didn't seem to be on display in a way that was visible to me. So that was certainly something I never learned, but I can tell you what was on display a lot. <laughs> let's um, let's, let's leave lot. that for another time. Um, I'd like to maybe let's move into um, any ideas or tips that we have that are, well, well, yeah. before, before we jump into that, I just, sure. I just want to say, I understand that, you know, we, we're trying to keep on track, but I think part of the focus of, of our having this talk is that little things around shared space can create significant conflict if they're not addressed. Yeah. So what you and I are talking about really is a way to prevent conflict, not mm -hmm. deal with it. Mm. 
Well, um, we can talk about both. Mm -hmm. um, and I think just for this opening salvo, uh, sorry about the um, war metaphor, but for this opening talk, why don't we start with just a couple of ideas that we have that will help people right now. Okay. Um, and we can, we'll have more to offer, I have a feeling, and we can go into all sorts of different um, rabbit holes at some point. But why don't we, you know, like, so some things that come off the top of our heads, um, maybe we can just go back and forth with it. Okay. Um, do you well, have, do you want to start? I, I, yes, I, I do. I mean, this, I've been thinking about this for a lot of years. I think the first thing is having a mental framework where we just acknowledge to ourselves and to other people that we live with that there is no such thing as a quote unquote normal person in private space. Mm. We all, if we have our own private space and we are alone, we all have our idiosyncrasies and our quirks and the things that we do that we don't necessarily want other people to see or the things that are habits that we're not even aware of. And none of these things are strange. We've all got them. And it certainly doesn't help in living with people to sort of blame other people for the quirks and idiosyncrasies that they have. Mm, that's very powerful. Um, what about yours? Yeah, the a thought that comes to mind and something that uh, is happening in my life right now is um, getting a good night's sleep. Mm. So the more that everyone in the household can get a good night's sleep, the better off everything will go. So things that can help people get a good night's sleep are, um, well, my number one tip around that is headphones like these. They're the kind you'd wear if you were in a shop and you were working with a power sander and they are $15. You can get them from your local uh, hardware store or um, anyway, I find these to be a really great way to get yourself back to sleep. If you wake up in the middle of the night, you can also, you can put them on at any time. You can put them on right away when you go to sleep. You can put them on at seven in the morning if you want to sleep another hour. I originally got these because I was going to music festivals and they can tend to be pretty loud at four or five in the morning. And so right away, I brought these with me and I since then have been very grateful for that. Um, other things are blackout curtains. So to make the room dark, mm -hmm. um, taking a shower before you go to bed with warm water, um, going to sleep earlier, going to, um, stopping coffee by noon. Mm, yeah, um, big one. And any other stimulants. And also turning off screens. The earlier you can turn off your screens before going to bed, the less you know, your mind's going to be jumbled. I know a number of uh, leaders in the world who recommend reading fiction before bed for an hour. Mm. So these are just some ideas um, around sleep. Yeah, well, um, you know, there are plenty of ideas around sleep. I mean, there's just from a ton of different modalities and traditions. Um, I know that as a meditator in spiritual traditions where I hang out, one of the things that comes from the Ayurvedic world, which is this ancient Indian system for maintaining good health over the course of your life. Uh, they recommend golden milk, mm. is, mm -hmm. which is heated milk of any kind. It, it can be cow dairy or sheep dairy or goat dairy, or mm. um, it can be coconut milk, it can be oat milk, whatever. So it's something that is kind of soothing. Mm -hmm. And you put turmeric into it, mm -hmm. and you put a little bit of um, nutmeg, in it as well, mm. and maybe a little bit of sugar if you like it, like, like, it, like it sweeter. And the Ayurvedic people say that this has a very calming, uh, they, they, they say it calms the winds, which is an Ayurvedic way of saying it calms mm. anxiety and it makes your emotional state kind of relaxed and easy, which is a very good way of preparing for sleep. Mm. Would, you, um, would you say people who meditate tend to sleep better? You know, there's an awful lot on the web about the benefits of meditation. Mm -hmm. And probably overall, yeah, I would. Mm -hmm. um, it certainly helps if you've been doing it a while because one of the issues about meditation is that things come up when you meditate. Mm -hmm. And if you are new to it and you have this expectation that you're gonna be blissed out all the time, you're gonna be really disappointed because 
meditation is really about providing this empty space for whatever is there to come up. Mm. And you have things that you're not attending to that are disturbing. They'll come up. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, over time, I think it is very good for sleep because it puts things out in the open and allows you to deal with them. Mm. Okay. Um, well, so speaking, so moving from sleep, which is a kind of a personal thing, though, if someone in your household isn't sleeping well, figuring out ways to help them sleep well um, will benefit you as well. Um, <laughs> uh, so th around that, I, an, an interesting area that uh, I think I'm exploring right now and experiencing throughout my life is how do you tell someone else that you live with something that uh, they may not want to hear? Um, so around that, like a, I, I imagine there, there really just needs to be like an openness of everyone at the table. There, an, a way of accepting feedback, a way of being open to that. And I have an article that I've written about that um, on my website, albertideation.com forward slash opening, where I talk about how if someone gives you feedback about something, um, really take it in. And you don't have to agree with it, but you should listen to it because the other person is probably stepping past their comfort area to offer this to you. They're probably offering it with love. And there may be a kernel of truth to it. You may not be able to hear the kernel of truth right away. And maybe there is no kernel of truth. But in any case, it really makes sense to listen to what the other person says and take it in rather than putting up our, our no right away, which we all tend to do. I know I grew up in a household where you'd start telling something, you'd start telling someone else something you thought about something about them, you know, like your your shirt is on inside out. And right as you say the word your, the defense mechanism would come up. So instead, my recommendation would be if someone's offering you some kind of input about staying healthy, getting a better night's sleep, doing something differently than you're doing, just listen to it. Listen to it. Ask a follow-up question. Why do you think that? Um, ask another follow-up question. Oh, and be grateful. Thank you for caring enough about me to share with me something that you're seeing. I appreciate that. And then if you want to discuss it, you can. You could also just say, thanks for sharing that with me. Let me take some moments to digest that. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to, you know, that, that was maybe difficult for me to hear or I'm not used to it or whatever. And then walk away and, and, and mull over what they've said. Maybe even write it down. And you may disagree, you may be, they may be wrong. Um, but the whole interaction can go a lot better and the potential of their being, um, also that opens up the other person, if you take the information graciously, even if you don't agree with it, that opens up possibly more um, information coming your way from the other person. We're all incredibly smart. Someone may have key information for you that you don't realize that they have. And if you're open to the, their feedback, um, you'll likely benefit from it. And especially right now, when we are in very close quarters with people, um, some of whom we may have struggled with in the past, it makes all the sense in the world to try to figure out some new ways of interacting with one another. Well, I, I would like to put some context around that idea. Sure. Because it's a very big thing. Um, certainly, most people don't like to receive advice, feedback, something that indicates that they are less than okay, according to some other person, or that they get a sense that some other person thinks that they need some help in some way. Right. When, and when we're sharing space with people, intimate space, not necessarily that, you, that they're a sexual partner, but that you're living in a domicile with them and you, know, and you are bumping into one another all the time. It raises the question of, well, what kinds of things should be up for discussion mm. between people who share space with one another? Mm -hmm. Clearly, in an ideal world, people would negotiate that. People would have some kind of a conversation like, let, let's say it's roommates. Let's say you, you and I were roommates. Um, hopefully, at some point, there would be a conversation where we would say, well, you know, that thing that you words you know 
I'm not living with you for you to provide me with a commentary about my fashion choices. And I like you, but I just don't think, I just don't want to have that kind of conversation. So let's steer clear of that. And I'm not, and I won't do that with you. I just don't think that's what we're about. Okay. But, sure. but what you're talking, the, the other part of what you're talking about is how to avoid the conflict, right? If, if something does have to be raised, how do we do it in a way where we don't go into what the uh, biologists call sympathetic overload? Mm -hmm. So it's like we all have this thing called the sympathetic nervous system, which is what everyone understands is fight or flight. When we get fearful or angry or aggravated, our heart starts pumping, mm -hmm. our adrenaline kicks in, we start to sweat. You know, we, we go into this place of fear, which is where we get into these things where we get into conflict with one another because we're being driven by this fear and we're not thinking very clearly. How do we avoid that? Mm, right. Hey, um, I think we've hit uh, a nice spot for a break. And so okay. stick, stay on the line with me. I'm going to um, turn off the recording, but we'll be back with you all again soon. And thank you so much for um, your attention. And if you have ideas for either of us, um, you're welcome to add them into the comments below this video. And if you'd like to see more of this, feel free to um, sign up for the email list that'll be also tagged on this video. And we will come back at you with more thoughts soon. And I'm also interested in finding other people that might have insights into ways um, that people can live together more, um, more better. <laughs> well, bye everyone. Be safe out there and be kind to one another and yourselves. Very good. Thanks.